Okay, so the situation is that the governor is refusing to release $11.5 million in LMF funds that were approved by the voters of Maine in 2010 and 2012. This is an absolutely unprecedented situation. In the 195 years of this state, no governor has ever done this, blocking the release of funds that were voted on by the electorate. The citizens passed these bonds to be spent for a purpose, and the governor is holding them, and he's holding the, all the projects that had been approved to be, for that funding until he gets the demand that he's seeking, which is he wants increased timber harvesting on Maine's public forests. So this is an, a double injury here. He's refusing to move forward with some really good land conservation programs unless he can overcut our forests. So I'm going to walk us through some of this. Um, the governor has been belligerent about this, and it's not just the disruption of the funding flow. He is uh, blocking his commissioners from going to LMF board meetings uh, so that they don't have a quorum to move projects forward. When they do show up, they vote against projects. Uh, he uh, put a freeze on $2.2 million worth of cash on hand. He even tried to freeze some private money that was in the LMF account. Uh, he's refusing to fill vacancies on the board. And he's also blocking land conservation in other areas. People may have read the article in the paper in the last couple of days about uh, the state of Maine not moving forward with forest legacy uh, applications, which has been an incredibly important program for protecting working forests, conservation easements, and has paired well with LMF funds on a number of projects. So he's linking several different things here that have no basis being linked. The Land for Maine's Future program, he is saying no funding for that without increased logging on public lands. And he wants to divert the funding from this increased cutting toward a home heating program, which is ill-defined for low-income Mainers. I'm not going to talk too much about the, the diversion of funds to the low-income heating program, um, but I just will say that this is really ironic because the governor and his administration have repeatedly cut energy efficiency funding, and they did just ag again two weeks ago. They uh, moved to cut $7.5 million of funding from uh, low-income um, heating programs in, this, in the state's three-year triennial plan, the efficiency maintenance program is proceeding. So the governor is, on the one hand, blocking funding for energy efficiency while claiming he's not going to release LMF funding unless we overcut our forests and divert money towards energy efficiency. It really does not make any sense. So let me talk first a little bit more about the Land for Maine's Future program. It's been one of the most successful and important conservation programs in the state. It was started in 1987 uh, with an initial bond of $35 million. Every time a bond goes to the electorate, the electorate approves it by large margins, 60-65%. It has protected 560,000 acres of conservation and recreation land. It's protected water access, farmland conservation programs, which have been really important right here in the Dresden area to keep land in farming instead of having it developed. There have been commercial working waterfronts that are extremely important for commercial fishermen who, who need to preserve their access to the ocean for their, for their livelihood to continue. There have been working forests that have been protected through conservation easements and a lot of shoreline miles uh, of river and lake habitat, riparian zone habitat, and access for the public to, uh, to water. Right in, and I'm pleased to be in, many of you are, are in Jeff uh, Pierce's district and that's where, that's where we are right now. And I work well with Jeff Pierce. He's the Republican state legislator in his first term. Um, we've worked well on a number of issues, but as I'll explain uh, in this presentation, he's voted wrong on this issue. And it's really important that he votes right when he gets a chance coming in January. Um, he's just, and particularly given the interests in his state, in, in his district, he should not be on the wrong side of this issue. So there are six projects that LMF has, has moved forward with in this district. Brookings Bay in Woolwich supports 65 acres of high quality brackish tidal marsh. Hyatt Farm is one of these farms that has been protected through LMF funding uh, to keep it from moving into development. Kennebec River uh, parcel down in Georgetown. There have been uh, a couple of really important archaeological sites, one right here in, 
in Dre two right here in Dresden, I believe, uh, the Sprague Pond down in Phippsburg, and this, this um, Choice View Farm, which many of you are, are quite familiar with, uh, also has this Paleo-Indian encampment that was discovered by archaeologists. So there's, there's cultural history uh, on these sites. There are, LMF is a program that protects um, livelihoods of people who work in uh, farming, fishing, forestry, and really importantly, it's recreation lands for people who don't have the ability to just buy their private kingdom or their private place along the, the ocean front for their own privileged access. It is a program that is really for all of us and for future generations. That's why it has done so well at the ballot box. So there's 36 projects that have been approved by the Land for Maine's Future Board that have been waiting for funding. In the summer of 2014, they all got a letter saying that they'd been approved for funding uh, from that 2010 and 2012 bond. Those projects collectively would protect 50,000 acres for conservation, recreation, forestry. There's some really great trail systems that have been established uh, on LMF projects. These projects are in 37 communities, 13 counties, and they would leverage $30 million in matching funds. So that $11.5 million, there's a match requirement, and almost all of the LMF projects have, have exceeded the one-to-one -one match. So the, the, the projects that have been negotiated, in many cases for years, to pull these 36 together to the point where they're ready for funding from LMF, they have pulled in all sorts of matching grants. Um, all of these are being held hostage. And this is the second hostage taking of these same funds. So in 2013, the governor refused to release these same LMF bonds uh, because he wanted the legislature at that time to pay the hospital debt. And so he um, instructed the treasurer and the LMF board not to release any fundings, not, not to move forward. And when the legislature did pass a budget that included the funding to pay off the hospital debt, this was his press release statement. As a measure of good faith, I am hereby directing the state treasurer to begin to prepare those bonds for my signature on an expedited basis. That was about the LMF bonds in 2013, the same money that he's now holding hostage again for a new set of political demands. So the ransom demand that he's, he's insisting on right now before he'll release the LMF funding is described right here, I am not, and this was just in April, I'm not releasing the LMF bonds and will not approve current projects in the LMF pipeline until this timber harvesting legislation is sent to my desk. This is a bill that he has brought forward in 2014, 2015, and the legislature each time has rejected it because they sensibly, in a bipartisan way, have concluded we should not be treating our public reserve lands like an ATM machine that just is used to generate money to divert to whatever the governor's interest is today. And this isn't of ju just of concern because of this governor. Any governor in the future could just treat our public lands like our woodlot and liquidate it and generate cash for whatever the purpose is. That's not what these public reserve lands were uh, intended to be. So let me talk a little bit about the public reserve lands. We all know what our state parks are. Most of us are less familiar with the 600,000 acres, which are our pub public reserve lands. These lands were kind of rediscovered in the 1970s through research by the Portland Press Herald reporter at the time, Bob Cummings, who NRCM just gave a Lifetime Achievement Award to uh, last month. When the state of Maine was transferred from Massachusetts, became the state, uh, in the 1800s. Um, there was a, a trust of generally like a thousand acres or 1200 acres per township that was to be made available for the public. And over a period of time, the large paper companies kind of appropriated those lands and swallowed them up. And through the research of Bob Cummings, built the case for the state to reclaim those lands. And now we have some really wonderful parcels all over the state. There's 30 different units statewide. They're they are managed by the Bureau of Parks and Lands for multiple use management. This isn't just for timberlands. 
as the governor thinks it is. It's for recreation, for sustainable timber harvesting, for wildlife habitat. And it's, and it's been managed extremely well. So these are some of the best managed forest lands in the state. So Bigelow Preserve is, is a public reserve land. So those, some of these, Namakanta is one, Donnell Pond, Dabuli, uh, the Cutler Coast. These are, these are places where the, um, the harvesting has been light with an intention to protect the forest for wildlife habitat and for, um, we don't really call it old growth, it's mature stands. Maine doesn't have really any old growth left, but it's some of the biggest, oldest trees that we have. And there's a lot of wildlife that absolutely depends on big old forest lands. So this is some of the best, these are some of the best forests that we have. Um, and the, the light timber harvesting that is done, and it's selective harvesting, it's done extremely well, that harvesting creates the revenue that funds the management of our public lands. And that's the way it's supposed to be, that was the way it was set up. These lands were intended to be a trust um, to be managed and it was a dedicated revenue, st revenue stream for the purpose of protecting those lands. So this is Bigelow. I'll just show you some pictures of some of the public reserve lands that are in those 600,000 acres. This is Tumbledown. Uh, Tumbledown has been protected, all, some of it also has been protected with, with some LMF funding. Uh, this is Big Spencer, which is at the top end of Moosehead Lake. This is Donnell Pond. Uh, looking at it from Scudic Mountain. This is Chain of Ponds, which is out past Stratton and Eustis. There's some, you can get into these woods and they all are open to the public and there's, there's campsites, there's trails. It's not as well uh, labeled and there's signage isn't as good as it should be. Um, but many of these places are some of the deepest woods experiences you'll find anywhere in the state of Maine. These are the forests that the governor wants to overcut. Fortunately, um, NRCM and others started to, to raise the alarm on this back in 2014. We got word that the new, the new Forest Service Director, Doug Denico, had been meeting directly with the governor's office without the, the foresters at the Bureau of Parks and Lands, even knowing about it. And he was pushing for a radical increase in timber harvesting. Right now, without getting into the details, we've been cutting at about 141,000 cords per year. And that has been determined to be the sustainable level. Uh, Doug Denico, the Forest Service Director, directly with the governor, wanted to increase it to 220,000 acres a year, which is a really big increase and there were some whistleblowers within the agency and people who were on the scientific advisory uh, board that has been watching the harvesting and helping make sure that it stays sustainable, who contacted us, contacted the media, uh, made sure that the public knew. And so we did a big uh, Freedom of Information Act request, got a lot of internal documents that showed uh, what this administration was intending to do in terms of a, a drastic increase in cutting far beyond the sustainable levels for these timberlands. The legislature at the time, we produced this report just as the governor's bill was going through to ramp up cutting and divert it to home heating. Uh, the legislature soundly defeated the bill at the time, uh, overwhelmingly uh, at the committee level. And fortunately, the Attorney General's office recently has come forward with a, a, a a definitive legal analysis from our perspective. A commission was set up at the end of the last legislative session to look at how these funds should best be spent that are generated through our timber harvesting activity on public lands. And there is a, a reserve account that has about three or four million dollars in it. And uh, so a committee was set up, it's been looking at the issue, they requested an opinion by the Attorney General's office. The Attorney General came back two weeks ago with a letter that said, that um, although it has not been tested in the court, whether these funds could be spent for home heating or other purposes other than the trust purpose of, protect, of continued investment and management of our public lands, uh, what the Attorney General said is it would likely be shot down by the courts. So it would probably um, not be constitutional and would be an illegal diversion of funding 
and it would be challenged. And so what the governor is calling for is illegal. Uh, the diversion of funds that he wants to achieve is not permitted. And Tom Saviello, who's the co-chair of the committee, that's, uh, he's a Republican from Franklin County, he's the co-chair of this commission that's looking at the public lands uh, issue, uh, he was quoted as saying that this letter takes off the table the governor's uh, proposal to be diverting funds. And there seems to be, and this has been great over the last two years, really quite strong bipartisan opposition to the governor's proposal to increase cutting on our public forest lands. But the situation with LMF is still not resolved. So some public opinion polling that was done by Trust for, it was actually Mancos Heritage Trust, the Nature Conservancy, and I think Trust for Public Lands together helped pay for the, the uh, polling that was done a few weeks ago and released, um, showed, they asked the question of uh, a straight up, and, and there's a lot of awareness of this issue, so the, the people of Maine understand what the governor is doing here, and when asked, should the governor release these monies or sh he should continue to withhold them, 74% believe that when the people speak, through the ballot box and approve a bond, they believe that money should be spent for the purpose that they voted, it, voted for. They also were asked two different questions. Do you agree with this statement or the next statement? And the first statement it was, once the people of Maine have spoken at the ballot box, no one individual, even the governor, ought to have the right to veto that decision. Carrying out the wishes of the people ought to be respected. Do you agree with that? Or, or do you more agree with Land for Maine's future mostly helps wealthy, and la wealthy landowners and special interests, this is what the governor has been claiming, who come into the state and then decide they want to conserve these natural areas while taxpayers pick up the tab. The governor keeps claiming that we shouldn't be conserving land because it takes it off the tax roll and then it hurts the rest of us. By 79 to 16 percent, uh, Maine people believe that the will of the people should be honored and there's been legislative action to try to force the governor to release these funds. So uh, Republican State uh, Senator Roger Cates introduced a bill in the last legislative session, LD 1378. And, and he very strongly and eloquently told the committee and he, at a press conference when he announced it that no one, including the governor, ought to have the right to be able to veto what the citizens of Maine do at the ballot box. And he made the case this is a true statement regardless of Land for Maine's future. You don't want to set this precedent so that any future governor can decide, I'm not spending those transportation bond funds or those um, wastewater treatment facility bonds or these senior housing funding or until the legislature does this. The governor does not have that right to to veto this, the, the vote of the people of Maine um, and to use those bond funds for political leverage. So this was a really big issue in the last legislative session and we lost on it. And we lost on it in part because Jeff Pierce voted the wrong way. Um, he voted right and then he voted wrong. So this bill came up on June 11th uh, and it was voted on by the House and sent to the governor's desk. And on June 11th, you'll see I've got six Republicans here who all voted right in the House. Um, and the bill passed on June 11th, 102 to 48. 101 is the magic number of a two-thirds majority in the House that you need to override the governor. But when the governor then vetoed the bill and the bill came back on June 16th, these six legislators all flipped their vote. And they flipped their vote because they were pulled into the governor's office and instructed to change their vote, that the governor was, was insistent that he was going to win on this. And the top two Republicans in the House, Ken Fredette from Newport and Ellie Espling from, from uh, New Gloucester, who are the minority leader and, and the assistant minority leader stood right at the doorway as legislators were going in and I watched it and we all watched it as they grabbed Jeff Pierce and each one of these and directed them to go in 
and vote uh, contrary to what they had voted before. So all of these people, um, I feel like this is a hall of shame. These people um, flipped their vote even though they just weeks earlier they had voted correctly. And right now, we need to be putting pressure on these and another, there's another dozen Republicans who also, uh, we believe because of the interests in their district, um, LMF projects in their district, some of the 36 projects that are held hostage which are in this district. Representative Timmons here, he has one of these hostage projects, uh, Knight's Pond in his district. That's an incredibly important project. And his, the town council in his, um, in his district hauled him in and were furious at him that he would have switched his vote on this. And we're not sure he's going to change his vote. Um, but there's, a, there's quite a firestorm in his district of, of anger because in many districts, in the, many towns in the state of Maine, the vote for LMF when it comes to the ballot is like 70% or 75%. If you think that the, it, statewide it's passing at 65%, then there are towns that where it, hit, it hits 80%. And there's others that, you know, almost everywhere it passes by more than 50%. So these are the towns of, of Jeff Pierce's district. And these are the last six LMF bonds going back to 1987. And there's not a single town at a, for any one of these bonds that has ever voted less than 50%. So Arousic, Dresden, Georgetown, Phippsburg, Richmond, Woolwich, all of these towns hitting in Arousic 82%, 77% in Georgetown one year, 75% Phippsburg, 73% Woolwich. The people in his district really strongly have voted for LMF in the past. And for good reason. There's development pressures. There are natural resources in this district. There's farms that are facing threats. There's challenges to get uh, to, and preserve water access. So now it's going to go back to the legislature. So what happened in the last hours of the session in July, on July 16th, the governor brought a bill forward through Ken Fredette, the minority leader, that was going to extend the, the 2010 LMF money for seven additional months. So when the voters vote for a bond, as they did in, in 2010, that bonding authority is good for five years, and then it expires. And the money that the governor has been withholding, six and a half million from 2010, expired uh, on November 3rd. So that money that the people of Maine voted for um, is no longer available right now. But the Constitution allows the legislature Within two years after any bond has been has expired, they can reauthorize it for another five years. So, a bill has been introduced by Republican from Augusta, Matt Pouillot, that would extend the the authority for the 2010 money. So that bill has been approved for consideration this upcoming legislative session, and that will be voted on. But the much more important bill will come up in the first few days of January. And that bill is, as I mentioned, Ken Fredette brought a bill forward to just extend the authority for seven months. And Representative Jeff McCabe in the House offered an amendment to strike that language entirely and to replace it with language that directed the governor to work with the Land for Maine's Future Board and the treasurer to release the money. And that bill passed by a majority in the House and Senate and has been sent to the governor's desk and has been sitting on his desk and he has three days um, from when the legislature convenes on January 6th to sign it, veto it, or let it become law without his signature. We expect him to veto it. So this is LD 1454. It will likely be vetoed on January 7th or 8th. Um, and these are the different provisions of it. The governor needs to work with the LMF board to release the money. He has to work with the treasurer. The LMF board is granted final authorization for borrowing of any money. 
The governor should not be in the, in the process in, of, of asserting that he controls when and what, what, whether uh, these bonds are borrowed. And the governor needs to sign all documents for any LMF bond that is issued and made available for LMF projects. And we need all of these six people to switch their votes. Uh, the bill passed 90 to 52, and there were eight absent. Uh, of those eight absent, four were Democrats, four Republicans. So we think we have, this is going to be a really close vote. So we think we have a, we're at a starting point of 94 votes. But there was actually, there were two Democrats who seats who were up in at the elections and they were they both flipped to be Republicans. So um, Bill Noon uh, was one of them. Um, his wife ran to, he died of cancer and his wife ran and lost by a very slim margin. Um, another legislator moved from his district and that district then uh, elected a Republican. So we need 101, we're actually kind of more at like 92. We need probably seven votes. And so um, the conservation community, uh, and it's way beyond the conservation community. One of the, the loudest voices in support of this is the Sportsman's Alliance of Maine. David Trahan, a former Republican state senator, who's the executive director of the Sportsman's Alliance of Maine, can't even get a meeting with the governor to talk to him about three extremely important LMF projects that are in those 36 that are being held hostage. Extremely important to hunting and fishing uh, advocates in the state. Uh, these are um, lands that are gonna provide access for hunting, some of the best brook trout fishing in the entire Northeast. Uh, these are really, uh, and also deer wintering yards, which are important for preserving the uh, deer habitat. Almost no one that we know of who has tried to, to meet with the governor has, allowed, has been allowed to even get in and talk to him. Bill Vail, who the governor appointed as the chair of the LMF board, has re requested repeatedly to meet with the governor to talk to him about the LMF program. This is a program that was designed to be nonpartisan. When it was first put together, everything about it has been nonpartisan. Bill Vail was the head of the Maine Forest Products Council. He was Senator Susan Collins' district director in the state. He, he teaches skeet shooting uh, at L.L. Bean. He is this rock solid Republican who can't get a meeting with the governor to even try to persuade him that he's wrong on the LMF issue. So we are working really hard to make sure that constituents in every district of any Republican who we believe um, might move our way feels the pressure from their, um, from their voter, the voters in their district um, to vote the right way when LD 1454 comes up. So one of the things for any of you that are in uh, Jeff Pierce's district that I'm gonna ask you to do um, I do, we do have a petition that we've been gathering signatures on. If you have not signed that yet, we have collected way over a thousand signatures in dis different districts uh, of these and some other legislators. Um, so if you're in one of the towns in Jeff Pierce's district, we're gonna urge you to, to sign this petition, which will then be delivered to Jeff sometime in the next month. So our, our goal, you know, this is a little, I mean, we got to get rid of these links. There should be no connection between any of, of these issues. It's entirely artificial and it's um, inappropriate and it's seriously damaging uh, one of the most important conservation programs in the state. And we need the LMF program to get back on track because it really is and has been one of the most important ways that we protect the continue to protect the character of the state that we so love. So why don't I stop there, and I'd be glad to answer any questions you have.